Okay. We are at our third uh, category of uh, sort of our cardiovascular system. Uh, we've learned a little bit about blood. Uh, it seems like you've been learning about the heart uh, based on what I've seen so far, so that's good. Uh, now we conclude that, uh, that trilogy, if you will, and, and it's not necessarily sequential. We don't go blood, heart, vessels. They, they are all integrated together simultaneously, but we presented them you know, in, in, this, in this sequence. But we address now the vessels themselves, right? These blood vessels. Uh, if you survive the heart, this is going to be a piece of cake. Vessels are not uh, anywhere near as complicated as, as the heart, right? There's a lot of stuff in the heart, but, but vessels, pretty straightforward. The first uh, sort of uh, distinction we're going to make is to distinguish arteries from veins, right? And, and we've kind of mentioned this before a little bit, but arteries are going to carry blood away from the heart and veins carry uh, blood back towards the heart, right? So away, A, arteries, veins, uh, in Spanish, ven, right? Uh, come, uh, move this way, move closer. So uh, arteries carry blood away from the heart, veins carry blood towards the heart. And um, I don't remember the exact details, but uh, one of these little uh, like IQ test questions uh, in, in, in grade school, um, there was a picture of a forest. You can, if you can envision like a, an aerial view of a forest. And there was a picture of a dog kind of running into the forest. And the question said something like, how far can the dog run into the forest? I don't know. We're like third grade or something. Like, I don't know. Because the dog looks pretty fast and healthy. He can run far, right? Well, um, no, that's not right. Well, how far can that dog run into the forest? So if this is the forest, this, well, let's say this is the forest. The dog is running into the forest. How far can he go? Well, uh, the correct answer, which I didn't get in third grade, right? but the correct answer was that that dog can run halfway into the forest. Yeah, halfway because once you pass the halfway mark, you're no longer running into the forest. You're running out of the forest, right? Like, oh, yes, it made sense, teacher, third grade. Yeah, but, but I, just this conceptual idea. So... How far can the blood go away from the heart? Well, halfway, right? It, it goes away from the heart until it reaches a point where it starts then to return to the heart. And that transition from going away to coming back is going to happen at this area we call capillaries. Capillaries are the transitional area. And they're also going to be important for uh, being the sites for gas exchange, for nutrient exchange, uh, waste exchange, that kind of uh, uh, trading off of information, right? And, and you see a, a color change. So in systemic circulation, uh, we leave the aorta, this major artery, we get into this network of arteries. We're going away, 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 away. We start to see a transition in the color. We go from a red to a purple to a blue, right? So we give up oxygen, and then we have to go back to the pulmonary circuit to pick up oxygen. So this is a systemic uh, situation. If we're talking about a pulmonary situation, uh, the, the artery would be blue in that case, transition to a sort of a purple color, and then red as it leaves there, right? So again, arteries carry blood away from the heart. They're oxygenated except for the pulmonary circulation and the umbilical vessels of the fetus. And again, you, you'll learn more vessels later here. But. So just showing you kind of a crude schematic here. There's the pump, the heart. We start to leave through that aorta. We call these the elastic arteries. They have to be able to withstand the bumping heart, a huge surge of pressure. So they stretch and then they recoil back. So elastic, also known as conducting vessels. We have muscular arteries, distributing vessels, and we keep getting smaller and smaller, and depending on how you want to pronounce it. Uh, in the US, they tend to pronounce them arterioles, the correct Latin uh, pronunciation, arterioles. Right, so we have our little arterioles, or arterioles, which are the smallest of the smallest 
vessels of the arterial system. We then run into our capillary beds. And then we start to kind of merge into our venous system, right? So we have our small veins, capacitant vessels, and then these large veins there. So if you can think about travel as far as a highway, right? So you start off, let's say we're going to go, I don't know, to San Antonio, to Phoenix, something like that, right? So uh, we start to merge onto these big highways, I-10. And then once you get closer to your area, you exit the big highway to a, uh, let's see, a smaller street. And then you keep going, you exit into a smaller street until you get to that little alley or that little, that little drive-in, right? So uh, now the reverse, you leave that little house and you get to a bigger street and a bigger street and a bigger street then to I-10. Yeah. And that's sort of the situation here. Green, we'll address that in the next chapter. These are part of the lymphatic system. But right now, we're focusing on the vessel uh, anatomy, vessel physiology, blood vessel. Uh, tunics. Uh, tunics are basically the circular layers that make up the, the blood vessels themselves. And um, tunic comes from that sort of old Greek term that means like a like a little cloak a little cape something that you can wrap around so to me tunics always remind me of like tortillas you can make a tunic if you don't want to call them burritos you make a little tunic of uh, of whatever you're eating there right so there's going to be three tunics so we have the tunica intima it's intimate it's nice and close to the to the to the blood itself right so it's going to be lining the inside of the tortilla coming into contact with that breakfast uh, goodness area. Yeah? So it's part of the endothelium of the blood vessel themselves that is going to be coming direct in contact with the blood. The tunica media is basically the muscular layer, that smooth, that visceral sort of circular layer uh, that, that allows for vasoconstriction or vasodilation. Right? That's what these uh, vessels are going to be able to do. And then uh, the old term was the adventitia. I never understood what that meant. So uh, I like the new term better, tunica externa. That makes sense because it is outside. It's an external layer. Right? So uh, if you remember, I hope you remember, it hasn't been that long. Uh, we started to look at our clotting pathways, intrinsic, extrinsic. And if you remember, collagen was a key component uh, that initiated one of those pathways, right? I'll let you remember which one. But again, that's the external tunic. That's the outer layer of the tortilla there, right? So tunica intima, media, and external. Uh, we're gonna see a distinction between the arterial side and the venous side. So let's look at the inventia, the, uh, the external, which I like. In gray, that looks pretty similar. So it's a tough outer layer. Uh, what is a little bit different is the media. The muscular layer is much more uh, thicker. So artery walls have a thicker muscular layer than do the vein walls. And then the intima is kind of similar between uh, both there. So this one shows it a little bit better. This is more to scale, more realistic here. So the externa, again, similar in both veins and in the arteries, the media, we see a thicker layer of smooth muscle that encircles the entire lumen. The lumen is a hollow area, uh, a very thin layer of muscularis there, the, the media layer. And then the intima, again, pretty similar for the endothelium, subendothelial layer, so not too much of a difference there. Arteries, arteries, these big elastic arteries, right? You see the large lumens, low resistance, uh, muscular distributing arteries. Again, that thick media layer, the lumen becomes a little bit smaller, so they are going to be able to regulate blood pressure a little bit better. I'm going to get to that in a bit. And then the arterioles, the smallest of the arteries, very, very thin. They control flow into the actual capillary beds. 
right? Capillaries. Capillaries are microscopic. You won't be able to see them uh, with your eyes, right? Microscopic, uh, so small that literally blood cells, here's our erythrocytes. Erythrocytes have to line up single file to be able to pass through these capillaries. So very, very small. A thin tunica intima, it's only one cell thick. So that's one cell, that's one cell, one cell, one cell. So very, very thin, uh, very, very narrow lumen. And there's a purpose for this, form fits function. By having a very tiny little uh, passageway, it's gonna make the flow of, of blood slow down. And that's good because we want blood to pass slowly. So we have enough time to unload oxygen unload nutrients, pick up carbon dioxide, pick up wastes. So there's a, a, a purpose for making this little path so narrow, right? so important. Now, there's gonna be a couple of different anatomical variations of the capillaries. Right? And, and here's the first type. Um, uh, we have then this idea of that sort of continuous little gap that we see here. Um, this is gonna be that red blood cell that's passing through. Uh, when I get into these next couple of slides, I'm gonna be using terms like fenestrations. A, fen a fenestra is basically a hole, a pore, um, little clefts. So these are gonna be important in the, the that intima layer of the capillaries and that's basically all they have right we don't really have the other media or the externa here it's just that intima layer um get to yeah here so capillaries we have then the continuous capillaries fenestrated capillaries and the sinusoidal capillaries okay so what does that mean so continuous capillaries are, again, our continuous capillaries are most common. And understand capillaries are designed to be leaky. They're supposed to be able to leak out oxygen, leak out nutrients, leak in wastes. So uh, we see these little gaps. Right? We see all these little slits that material can pass in and out of, depending on the osmotic pressure, uh, these clefts, intercellular clefts that allow passage through here. So these are the least permeable, they are permeable, but of the three types, they're the least permeable right, of, of these three. So continuous capillaries, clefts allow for the passage of fluids and small solutes. So it's just a generic type of, of capillary. So I'll say the majority of capillaries would be this type here, continuous. The fenestrated are gonna be sort of full of pores, right, like, like, like SpongeBob, right, porous is he, right, so these are full of pores, uh, these are the holy, um, they, they're full of holes, right, the holy type of, of, I guess, intima, so we have all these little pores, these little holes, these fenestrations that allow even for more fluids to, to move out or in across that, that boundary, so uh, where would we need more permeability? Well, maybe in the kidneys, right? Kidneys are going to have to filter a lot. They got to be efficient at filtering. Uh, maybe the intestines, we got to be able to extract a lot of nutrients from, from the food that's, that's been digested. And so these will occur in areas where we need more movement of solutes across this membrane. So the fenestrated, more permeable in the continuous allow uh, function and absorption or filtrate formation. And uh, we're gonna come back to this later with the urinary system for the kidneys. You'll hear those terms again later. Sinusoidal capillaries are gonna be the most leaky of the three categories, right? They allow large molecules in blood to pass through. It allows blood to literally pass the blood cells to leave the, uh, the actual vessel anatomy there. And we find these in the bone marrow. If you remember, where do we make our hemocytoblasts? They start out in the bone marrow, but then those cells have to sort of exit, leave, 
and send out the formed elements, the red blood cells, the variations of the white blood cells. So they have to be able to escape that uh, location. Let me show you what those look like here. You see, man, this is almost embarrassing, right? What kind of structure is that? What kind of anatomical mess do we have here? These huge gaps, these big pores, uh, very, very leaky, right? These big clefts. So sinusoidal, the most permeable of the uh, capillary types. So liver, bone marrow, spleen, anywhere we need things to, big objects to enter or leave those capillary beds. Uh, capillary beds, this is gonna be a little miniature version of uh, blood circulation, right? So micro circulation between arterioles and venules. So we call these the vascular shunt. Well, we have the microcirculation that we can sort of regulate by these vascular shunts, also known as uh, metarterioles or thoroughfare channels. So a lot of words that mean the same type of thing. Um, I don't know if you remember the idea of a sphincter, right? A sphincter is nothing more than a circular muscle around some sort of... Uh, vessel around a lumen that can again vasoconstrict to seal off flow or vasodilate to allow flow and, and again the words i don't think are that helpful i think it's a lot easier with a picture here so here we have our microcirculation our capillary bed right so this uh, capillary bed microcirculation between arterioli and venule so here's our arterioli and then here over here on the right is the venule. Now, this uh, vascular shunt, this metarteriole is a direct path. It's a straight shot from the arterioli to the venule. Yeah? So let's say that we have all the time in the world, we're in parasympathetic stimulation. Uh, yeah, we're just relaxing. Uh, we then have time to send blood to every little cell in this little micro area here. Right? Now, something happens. We're shifted into sympathetic circulation, sympathetic uh, sort of innervation. So now we need to get this blood more rapidly to other parts of the body. We need to send more blood to, to the heart maybe, right? Back to the heart. So we, we can do, we can shut off these little sphincters these little sphincters then can regulate, these precapillary sphincters can regulate how and where blood goes. So if these sphincters dilate, vaso, I'm sorry, they constrict, vasoconstrict, uh, we're gonna send blood directly and rapidly back to venous circulation. So this would be an example of sympathetic stimulation. Here we'd have an example of parasympathetic stimulation. So we do have the ability to regulate blood flow. It can go more here, go more here, depending on, on where it's needed. Uh, but let's analyze the brain, right? So the brain, uh, the brain doesn't actually care what's happening throughout the body. The brain is going to get its constant supply of blood. So blood flow to the brain is constant, irregardless if you're running a marathon, if you're asleep, if you're playing video games, if you're uh, just sort of zombified watching TV, whatever the case, the brain will get its constant supply of blood. Those neurons are not capable of, of being uh, anaerobic. They can't tolerate uh, any uh, anoxic conditions for, for any you know, significant amount of time. So the brain is vulnerable under extreme systemic pressure changes. So for whatever happens, whatever, you know, if, if, if blood pressure drops too low, then it does start to affect this constant supply of oxygen, blood flow and oxygenation to the brain. So if mean arterial pressure, which we'll analyze in a bit, if mean arterial pressure falls below 60 millimeters of mercury, uh, it can cause syncope. Syncope is known as, as, as fainting. Right? You know what is fainting, right? So... Uh, we can have syncope. If mean arterial pressure is above 160 millimeters of mercury, 
that can result in swelling of the brain. It, we're pushing fluid out of those leaky capillaries and causing too much pressure. So both of those uh, are, are not something that we want. We want to keep that constant supply. So if the, 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 the reason for this, right, it can be dangerous to faint. I, I can honestly say I've never fainted. Uh, I don't know, I hope you have not either, but if you have, there's a risk when you faint, you can fall and get injured, right? But as far as the brain is concerned, well, if you fall and break your hand, I don't care. I, 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 the brain is selfish. The brain wants its constant supply of blood. So if you are standing upright and blood pressure is, is not doing its job, blood flow to the brain is not consistent and we faint, then we are now in a sort of a flat position, right? Instead of standing, we're laying down somewhere, right? So that will then decrease the amount of gravity that in the, the force of gravity is making the heart push blood up. If we're laying down, less gravity is gonna be easier to get blood flow to the brain. So although it can potentially cause injuries, uh, the brain will risk that in order to get its own constant blood supply again. Uh, again, arterial pressure, high blood pressure, hypertension is not something we want either. Uh, can be a serious condition here. Cerebral edema is a serious condition. All right, so if we're looking at blood flow, right? Skeletal muscles, um, they're very different. The brain is constant. Skeletal muscles are completely non-constant. They are gonna get the amount of blood flow in proportion, in direct proportion to the amount of activity that they're doing. So the more the muscle is working, the more blood flow it's gonna require. The more it's resting, the less blood flow it's going to require. So during muscle, muscle activity, blood flow increases in direct proportion to the metabolic activity, uh, active or exercise hyperemia. That's what, what that means, right? More, um, more activity equals more blood flow. Muscle blood flow can increase 10 times or more during physical activity. So let's, let's look at the brain, right? So this is a total blood flow at rest based on about 5.8 liters. So again, we say it's around five liters of blood. This individual has 5.8 liters of blood. So uh, total flow at rest, well, the brain is getting about 750 mils um, of blood. Well, now we're actively playing. We're, we're running, we're playing basketball, we're swimming, we're doing something. If you notice the brain, brain don't care. Brain is still getting the same amount of blood flow. If we look, let's say at the skeletal muscles here, we're at 1,200. We're actively using those muscles. We jump up to 12,500, right? So that's a tremendous, that's a, as they say, about a 10 time increase in, in blood flow. And what makes that happen? Those little pre-capillary sphincters, the little microcirculation vascular shunt that starts to route blood to the, um, to the muscles. And if we know it's going to the muscles, we know it's being deprived from, from other parts, right? So uh, the heart increases as well. The heart needs to nourish its own myocardium, so there's an increase there. Um, the skin increases, right? As we get hot, we wanna uh, cool off. So we need to send a lot of uh, blood to the skin so we can have that evaporative cooling that, that it will enable us to reduce body temperature. Uh, what about the kidneys? Uh, the kidneys aren't working too well. Right? So we're getting less blood sent to the kidneys during exercise. We're getting less blood sent to the abdomen during exercise and collectively throughout the body, also a slight decrease. But uh, if you've ever felt those butterflies in your belly, like, oh, you get nervous, so you start being uh, sympathetically uh, stimulated, those butterflies that you feel is basically the reduction, the lack of uh, blood flow to those areas. So just think if you're sitting wrong and your, your leg falls asleep, you get that sort of tingly sensation. These butterflies in your belly are kind of uh, due to the similar kind of uh, physiological response here. So again, we have the same amount of blood volume, but it can be regulated uh, given to uh, parts of the body that require more blood flow for, for whatever reason, for cooling off, 
for bringing more oxygen and everything changes except again for the brain, right? Very, very consistent. So, okay, we've, we've come through the arteries. We've gone either through that vascular shunt or slowly through the whole capillary bed. Then we arrive back at the venule. And the venule uh, then feeds, that little venule feeds into the veins, which are what we call capacitance vessels. They can store blood. They can kind of expand and, and store blood. Um, and they're gonna be able then to uh, have these little valves and prevent backflow. So this is important, right? So most of the blood, so the majority of blood in your body usually is going to be within the veins. It just stays there a little longer than it does in the arteries. Pressure is lower. Um, these things can kind of expand. So as kids, we used to like squeeze real, real hard on our wrist and you, you kind of do that motion and then you, oh, look, it swells up and you can then, you know, poke the, uh, you know, poke and prod at the, at the veins there. That's possible because of this capacitance aspect there. This is a, a real life picture. So this is that thick tunica media of an artery. And this is the very thin sort of collapsed uh, view of a vein. Right? So this thing can really swell up, hold blood, uh, but again, doesn't have the ability to generate the same force, the same uh, vasoconstrictive force that an artery can. Well, these valves are very similar to the semilunar valves. Right? So as blood moves up, the weight of the blood, let's say this is in the leg, the gastronemius area, so the calf, right? so as we move blood up, it tries to go back down, but it kind of sits in here. And the more weight we put there, the better that valve is gonna stay closed. Right? So it allows it to kind of move incrementally up uh, the legs back up to the heart. Um, I'll let you read through that. Just kind of a little compare contrast of the arteries versus the veins. And again, this is kind of generic. There's, there's differences, there's similarities, there's more uh, depending on, on how specific we get, we can find exceptions, but this is again a very generic type of little analysis there. So that will do it. Uh, not too bad as I mentioned. All right, so that concludes our discussion on vessels. So let me get this uh, started to convert. Um, I'm going to grade a little bit of stuff. Uh, later this evening I'll uh, record the next video on uh, blood pressure, which is basically going to be what we would have done in lab, uh, but it does have some implications and does have some uh, concepts that will help you complete the uh, the next uh, sort of assignments you have on Pearson there, right? So uh, with that, let me conclude it and you'll have a good uh, rest of your evening here.